The Unshackled Waves, episode 234. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. With the Easter and Anzac Day holiday period over, the Australian federal election campaign is heating up, early voting has started and the parties have published their how to vote cards, the Liberals followed through with their promise to preference one nation below the Labour Party and have put uh, Fraser Anning's Conservative National Party last in most seats and have done a preference deal with Clive Palmer's United Australia Party. Bill Shorten is continuing to lie on Adani and taxes and is trying to weasel his way out of a primetime debate. The election commitments from the Coalition and the spending commitments from the Labor Party are now coming thick and fast. Polls are being published more regularly, so there is a lot to digest. Over in the United States, even though their presidential election isn't until November 2020, the race has been shaken up with the entry of former Vice President Joe Biden to the Democratic primary race. To discuss all these things, I welcome back to the show the senior editor of The Unshackled, Damien Ferry. Damien, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Tim. Uh, now, there's three weeks to go until polling day, but the, the first votes are going to start to be cast in early voting, and we've just got the, the latest opinion polls. Uh, the, the most anticipated is, of course, the, the news poll, which shows that the gap has narrowed. It's now uh, 49 LMP, 51 Labor. We also had Galaxy on the Sunday morning, which was 48 to 52 uh, in Labor's favour, and the Morgan uh, poll uh, a few days ago, which had uh, the LMP at 49 uh, and Labor at 51. So there's definitely, across all the polls, there's definitely a tightening there, and you'd have to say that it's it's Bill Shorten unravelling and, and being exposed as a, or a liar and a phony. Yeah, I'm actually um, surprised that it's not tighter than that. I, I think it's quite common that the closer we get to election day, that the polls do tighten and I mean we might even see um, a poll coming out right on the eve of the day in itself um, that says 50-50 um, for instance it wouldn't surprise me because I think it really shows the discontent in the electorate that um, they both generally don't like the major parties either one of them for different reasons um, I think if you're on the right um, you definitely despise the Labor Party, but at the same time, you really cringe about the Liberal Party getting in and you hope they just scrape in just because the Labor Party is worse, not because the Liberal Party is a good alternative. So I, I definitely think that it's, it's going to be close, um, the election race in the end. And I think um, one thing that we could hope for really on our side of politics is maybe a hung parliament. So we do get some sort of uh, minor parties um, calling some shots. And if it does um, destabilise the system a little bit um, in the long run, it might work out um, in our favour. Well, if it was a hung parliament, it depends who the independents are, because there's mm. uh, Rob Oakshot, who's trying to make a comeback in, in Cowper, uh, up in the, the north uh, central coast of New South Wales. And then there, there's also, well, imagine if Karen Phelps gets back in and Zali Stegall wins in uh, Warringah, you don't want sort of that crossbench. Definitely. I mean, <laughs> one, one thing we do sometimes get confused of um, when it comes to independence is that uh, most people do generally think independence automatically when they are independent, that they're, you know, right wing, but that, that's not the case. Obviously, the ones we currently have aren't. So um, if it means that, then definitely not. But I'm hoping that there, there is some good alternatives out there. I mean, I wouldn't mind someone like a cutter, for instance, um, having the, the balance of power. Um, even though that might be a, a hard ask because he only has the one seat. But uh, people like that, for instance, if they did have balance, then that wouldn't be a bad thing at all. And as I alluded to, uh, Bill Shorten, uh, his lies have been exposed. He's, 
he, he's used weasel words on the the Adani coal mine in uh, central Queensland. Uh, Bob Brown's Adani convoy has arrived in uh, Claremont in central Queensland, and uh, the the locals aren't reacting well to these out of towners coming in saying no, you can't have uh, local jobs. And Bill Shorten, it's it's always annoyed me. He's used these weasel words like, well, if it stacks up environmentally and economically, that code for I'll I'll try and find a reason to, to cancel the project and of course the the news has has dug up now that Shorten said a year ago that he doesn't uh, support it it was Mark Riley at Channel 7 who who asked him about it and then he and then he said to a a voter who said I do a lot of overtime I earn $250,000 a year I'm worried about my taxes and he's like oh well look at that that's not Labor's policy he lied to a voter and you know the media is starting to do their job scrutinizing him a bit closer he didn't like the the, the Channel 10 reporter the other week asking him a, a tough uh, question and now he's trying to avoid getting out of a prime time debate because there's the uh, the debate on Channel 7 tomorrow night, but that's on 7-2, their secondary channel. On the main channel, they've got Home and Away. And then there's a People's Forum on Sky up in uh, Brisbane on the Friday, but that's on subscription uh, television. And he doesn't want to do one on free-to-air prime time on the ABC or the Nine Network. That doesn't surprise me because Bill Shorten really is the, the worst... Um worst thing that uh, Labor Party have. They're, that's their liability right there in their leader. I mean, I've actually um, spoken to a lot of people that uh, even Labor supporters, and they say they absolutely hate Shorten. You know, I mean, um, even though they would um, vote for Labor because that's the party that, that they choose and that, that they uh, preference, but um, they just really dislike uh, Shorten as a leader. And, I mean, you can see it in his face. Every time he speaks on TV, he just has a very disingenuous um, approach. Like, I mean, you can just see that what he's saying is, is you know, he's, he's not really passionate um, and dedicated to the job, that he uh, hasn't got really any strong principles. He kind of reminds me of a... Um, of a lot of the, the left-leaning liberals in their party, that they're just really there just to, to, to sort of um, go with the flow and they're not really, you know, strongly uh, um, opinionated, strongly principled. Um, and I think Shorten, he's done a lot of errors, like you mentioned, you know, like he's, he's made a lot of mistakes. Uh, he hasn't been very um, uh, informed on his own policies. And this Adani, this Adani issue, I mean, I think that's going to apply in the, in the mind of a lot of voters. Uh, I, I think the Labor Party has really abandoned their base here, which were the working class, and instead has gone down this road um, towards the Greens to the inner city. And there's only so many seats in the inner city you can win. And at the end of the day, they're not going to change, but over in the regional areas, those seats can, can definitely swap over. And even if Labor Party do pick up seats in Victoria, they can lose seats in Queensland. And at the end of the day, they're not going to get anywhere, you know? I mean, they're going to lose some, gain some, and we're going to end up with the same result, and the Liberals will still be in power. So, I mean, the, the, the Labor Party have to understand that it's going to be harder than they think. I mean, they need to win five seats in their own right. And um, even though on paper it sounds simple... There is some seats that can swap towards the Liberals as well. Yeah, Bill Shorten, he just comes across as really fake. I mean, he comes across mm. as lifeless, he's being called a NPC uh, politician. Uh, some have been even more disparaging, uh, talking about his uh, man boobs. But yeah, he just doesn't come across as authentic. But Scott Morrison, for all his flaws, he comes across as, you look like you'd have a real conversation with him he's he's down to earth he's got an actual personality whereas shorten it, it'd be like you you're with a robot exactly and i think a lot of people are picking up on that i think uh it was actually interesting when they both went to church the other week um during easter and um i mean scott morrison um he actually let people in um to photograph him uh, at the the pentecostal uh church that he worships at um and he had his arms you know raised in the air as they do and 
to be honest, I mean, most people would think that's pretty bad optics because it's something that is quite taboo still, those kind of churches and everything. But you have to hand it to him because he did something taboo that wasn't going to buy him any support, but he still did it anyway and didn't mind that sort of criticism and was proud of who he was as a person. And that's the sort of thing that people, you know, uh, respect. Whereas um, Shorten, on the other hand, you could tell he went to church because he had to go, not because yeah, he wanted yeah. to be there. You know, and a lot of people see that, you know, that one person is more genuine as a candidate, whereas the other isn't. He's just doing what needs to be done. And um, he just doesn't really care about what he's saying. Um, every time he speaks, it's, yeah, like you said, very NPC attitude, you know. Like, I mean, you just see right through his words. And, he, I mean... He, there's been a lot of times where uh, he's backtracked on things. Uh, he hasn't been informed about what he was supposed to be speaking on. And that, and it's good that reporters are actually finally criticising him because I think this is why, in many ways, that the, the polls are tightening because there's a lot more criticism attached to him now, whereas they've given him a free ride in the past. Yeah, and going back to Adani, I mean, he wouldn't sign the CFMEU pledge to uh, approve the, the Adani coal mine. I mean, he's basically uh, betraying one of his, his biggest backers in the CFMEU. I mean, why would you be a member of a union today when they'll just sell you out? I mean, look at Shorten's history as a, as a union leader. I mean, they, they, they pretty much just look after the... Uh, elites they they don't care about the the working class at all and and this adani thing it's i mentioned the the, the people in claremont uh where the mines are going to be they're refusing service to the 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 fly-ins and that i mean it's so insulting that these invaders come in and say no we know how your town should operate better than you know yourself and and bill shorten is okay with that and anastasia palaszczuk says oh both sides need to be respectful it's a, it's a disgrace i mean people at the end of the day live in a community the people in that local area should have a say as to what's going on in their local area not people from outside um, I mean, if these people here don't want any coal mines over in the city, which there aren't any, and they want to live, you know, um, the vegan lifestyle and, you know, want to do this and that, I mean, they're free to do that, and they do do that. But why is it now that even though they're living the life they want, they feel that they have to go and dictate to everybody else outside of area? I mean, no matter where you go, in if it's in Queensland or anywhere else in the country, there's going to be... Um, areas with very differing views. I mean, we've seen the north-south parallel or regional and city. There's there's so many different views out there. And uh, a person living in a regional area isn't going to think the same as someone living in a city area. I mean, if they want to live the lifestyle they choose to, no problems at all, but don't go out into Queensland other state and think that your environmental policies are somehow going to change things and, and prevent these people from um, having jobs and, and having a boom in the local economy. And, you know, I mean, these, these, this is why, like you mentioned, the Labor Party have really betrayed the working class. And this isn't a modern phenomenon. I mean, I actually remember, and this is something that always sticks in my head, I, I think if you go back to 2004 when Latham was leader, and the whole um, Tasmanian issue when, with the logging. Do you remember when um, uh, he was with Bob Brown in the forest? And, uh, yeah. And Latham actually... Yeah, and Latham took a very environmental green approach there, and that backfired, and then you had John Howard being embraced by all these, you know, loggers, these working-class guys, right. and, and they won all the seats in Tasmania. I mean, that was massive, and this can happen. I mean, if people don't think that... Um, local jobs are important and that people are just going to be rusted old, you know, um, Labor voters, I think they've got another thing coming. As soon as you threaten someone's livelihood and someone's um, cost of living or their job is at risk, then this, this is the moment that people turn and they actually start thinking and, and they don't start going on the tribalistic manner that they normally do when it comes to voting. They'll, they'll start to think, OK, you know, this party isn't doing anything for me. Um, if I want things to get better, I need to change. And that's why it happens, you know, and that's what's going to happen with, with, um, with this issue with Adani. 
Now, with all the candidates declared, uh, you and I have uh, spent uh, probably a few hours now looking through all the various candidates and, and parties that have put their, their, their name forward. It is a much more limited field in the Senate, at least, because it's not a double dissolution uh, with no group voting tickets anymore. It's harder for minor and micro parties to, to get that 14.3% uh, to get uh, a quota. But uh, because the advice given to voters in the Senate is to put a uh, number of the boxes above the line one to six, that allows limited preference deals to be done between the parties. And so uh, they don't publish their how to vote cards on the, the AUC website like they uh, do at various uh, state levels. Uh, but we've, we've come to know uh, through various reports who's preferencing who. The most significant is uh, Scott Morrison has done a preference deal with Clive Palmer's United Australia uh, party. They're at 5% in the uh, news poll that we just uh, went through. Uh, that's what $50 million worth of advertising will buy you. And I just can't believe Scott Morrison. I mean, he was immigration minister when uh, Clive Palmer was first in parliament and he blocked all of Tony Abbott's budget measures. He and his uh, statist uh, senators just said no. Like he even blocked the repeal of the, the mining and carbon tax and he went all green. I mean, that's how uh, like, all over the shop he, he was. And he gave us, you know, Jackie Lambie, who's the, I think the most statist politician we've ever had. She's trying to make a, a comeback now. And it's like, why would you do a deal with this sociopath who just, you know, goes with whatever is popular. You know, he says he's against the Paris Agreement now, but he stood with Al Gore. I mean, you know, what what are you thinking? Like, don't you, like, haven't you seen this movie before? Don't you remember what happened last time? <laughs> I, I, I think, I think the, the sort of, um, the thinking involved here is um, that uh, there's been a lot of hype around Clive and, and the money that he's been putting into it. And, you know, the Liberals think that, you, you'll be able to get some sort of traction there. Uh, I mean, in, at the same time, though, I mean, the Liberals could have easily uh, had a, a great impact if they had um, done a preference deal with One Nation and they refused to do it and they actually refused to put them, you know, below Labor, which I think is such a you know, ridiculous... Yeah, yeah, fact that, that they'll, they'll do yeah. a preference deal with someone as crazy and as unhinged as Clive Palmer, but, you know, One Nation, a party with actual policies, it's like, oh, we'll put them below the Labour Party. Uh, Fraser Anning will put uh, uh, dead last in, in every seat except for uh, Jim Saleem of Australia First because he's a neo-Nazi. Yeah. Well, um, the, the funny thing is, I mean, what does Palmer actually stand for? We don't know. I mean, when you hear his commercials that he has, his adverts, um, they're very generic. Oh, we're trying to make Australia great. Yeah. You know? Uh, we're we're, we're going to be, you know, behind the people, this and that. But he doesn't actually mention what he believes in. I'm sure, no. don't get me wrong, I'm sure his website might, might go further into detail. But <laughs> it, it doesn't. It, it, it doesn't? Well, there no. we go. <laughs> but, but like I said, I mean, not many people know where he stands. I mean, a lot of people would assume that he's sort of like, um, you know, um, a populist kind of right wing. But it, it's very hard to say, you know. I mean, uh, I think he's marketing himself as some sort of centrist. But in saying that, that could also mean that um, people would then see him as unprincipled. And um, in, mm. in saying that, maybe a bit of a... Um, um, that, that he's in it for his own sort of, um, uh, you know, rather than for the country, you know, that because like last time that he was in Parliament, he hardly attended Parliament. He was only there a few times in the year. And, um, yeah, you know, like, apart from that, I, I just I just found it disgraceful that, I mean, a party like One Nation, which really, I, I wouldn't call One Nation extreme by any you know, by any sort of means. And, I mean, people like, for instance, Darden and, and I guess the Conservative, you know, faction of the Liberal Party would have very similar sort of views to One Nation, but, um, hardly any different at all. And and yet One Nation is placed, be, placed below Labor. Um, and, I mean, that's like asking the Labor Party to pre preference the Greens behind the Liberals. I mean, you know, and have the, the Liberals before the Greens. I mean, they wouldn't do that. Mm. Yet, for some reason, every election we see... 
we always have reporters coming out of the woodworks hassling the Liberal Party and pressuring them. Oh, where are you going to put One Nation? Are you preferencing them? And then they reference John Howard. Oh, you know, John Howard once said that One Nation was going to be last. You know, they always reference him, of course. And, um, you know, this is the problem here. Like, why aren't they going to the Labor Party and saying, oh, where are you going to put the, the, the far left Greens? You know, are you going to, you know, preference them last? You know, nobody says it, you know. Everyone assumes like, oh, yeah, Labor and the Greens are a good mix, but somehow the Liberals and One Nation aren't. So um, I think, you know, this this will hurt them, you know. Mm. It's just really a, a gutless move, you know, and a lot of people play into the whole globalist versus nationalist kind of rhetoric. And, I mean, a lot of people see the Liberal Party as nothing of difference, you know, and that's why people are voting minor because the Liberal Party isn't really providing that that difference to the Labor Party. They're, they're very much one and the same. In a lot of ways, they're, they're pretty socially progressive, the Liberal Party these days. Uh, oh, well, and, yes. And, Scott yeah. Morrison, who's supposed to be, you know, a social conservative, he hasn't mentioned, like, culture war issues at all. Yeah. Like... Uh, you know, remember there was that uh, Chinese uh, liberal candidate who there, there was audio to, uh, of her saying that, um, you know, Chinese people didn't want, you know, same sex marriage, transgenderism, mm -hmm. safe schools. And like, uh, like she said, oh, you know, I was just, uh, it, it wasn't my own views. And Scott Morrison said, oh, no, she's definitely not a homophobe. And then apparently there were these <laughs> anti safe schools adverts on, on WeChat, the Chinese messaging app. And, you know, the Liberal Party was like, oh, it's nothing to do with us it's not authorized by us you know don't don't, don't blame us like yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's yeah. been yeah i mean and not only that what about when he came out and criticized for Lao? well yeah he, he said he, yeah he said that you know he uh, he uh, wasn't compassionate yeah i mean like this is the thing everyone thought that this guy was going to be you know a real christian conservative you know like but he's i, I guess you know since Turnbull um, tried to put him in, 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 in um, to, to prevent Dunn to, to, to get in himself, you know, there wasn't going to be much of a change of direction, and there wasn't. Um, you know, it's just, it's just ridiculous, isn't it? Like, you, you think you're getting one thing, but at the end of the day, um, surprised, and um, it's nothing much different to what when Turnbull was in in the first place. It's it's well, really, I don't think um, yeah. ScoMo would ever go to Mardi Gras like Gladys or, or, or Malcolm, <laughs> but, you know, he's... You never, he... <laughs> you, never, you never know, Tim. You never know, eh? I mean, he, he, he might end up turning that way. I mean, if he's, if he's willing to change so much, at least uh, when it comes to his social sort of stances on things and, you know, be very soft when it comes to the culture wars, you, you just don't know, do you? I mean... Mm. Uh, Maybe not as inclined as they would, but uh, at the same time, like, you, you just don't know what the future holds, really, for ScoMo. I mean, you know, if he continues to sell out as he is and, and go down that uh, progressive path, then, yeah, you well, know, you it's look, definitely worth watching. Yeah, well, if you look what the coalition's announced on uh, immigration, so they've already announced that they're reducing the, the annual migration intake from 190,000 to 160,000. Wow, a cut of 30,000. And then they've also announced that they're, they're capping our refugee intake at 18,750 per year. So they're saying that we're freezing the increase that Labor's promising. That's that's basically what their <laughs> what their policy is. And they've also said that well, this, this one is is actually quite good. Sixty percent of the refugees allowed in will be women, because of course you know from the like Middle East and that it's always the the single working age uh, men that that always come. So at least they're putting a stop to that rot. Yeah, yeah, but the only problem they they forgot was that women actually breed and and they actually um you know have sons oh but what if grow up <laughs> yeah but what if um oh. those men who come what if they identify as women <laughs> well that that would be interesting wouldn't it i mean I w it would be funny actually just to see um where where that puts the liberals like what what sort of angle then they they, they try and sort of um go for because they're trying to appease everybody but uh yeah, I, I mean, the, the problem is that it isn't really a change to immigration and, and the refugee. I mean, the, the people have to understand is that every time heaps and heaps of people are coming here to this country, 
Uh, we've had a, a massive rise of uh, house prices because the demand is, is, is going through the roof, congestion issues with traffic. We've got issues regarding um, welfare. Welfare continues to rise because a lot of these people, um, they go straight on to welfare and they get handouts. And not only that, the ones that are genuinely coming here to work, then that just makes the job queue much greater. And it, we've got already, as it is, more people than there are jobs. So, I mean, the issue we have is that we're only making that queue bigger which is only going to make it harder for people that are already here looking for work because then there's going to be people coming over and a lot of people, um, it also drives wages down because a lot of people are cheap labour, you know, and, and, and they try to put little little stops to that, but there's always going to be loopholes. And regardless, like I said, the, the, the issue or the main issue is that unemployment's going to continue to rise. Reason being that there's just too, not enough work out there um, for the people here and the people that continue to come. And, and that's the big problem here. I mean, you have to give the jobs available to the people here. And then once you need more people for work, then sure. I mean, that's why we had immigration post-World War II, because there was just so much work out there and not enough people that they brought so many people from overseas. And we just don't have that now. I mean, there's no, you, you can't say that we're just booming, absolutely booming with, with the amount of jobs out there that we have to bring people in, especially when there's so many people um, on welfare and also people that um, are job seekers. Well, Labor, uh, they're, they're well, obviously, they're, the polls are tightening, so they're going to attempt to bribe their way to victory. And of course, there was the big uh, announcement from Labor today, uh, $4 billion increase in subsidies for for childcare, and that'll be uh, free. It's spread across various income uh, brackets. It'll be free for uh, some who are earning uh, less collectively than seventy thousand uh, a year. And uh, when I hear these, you know, increase announcement, I'm just like, wow, that's just more uh, spending. And then they also announced, uh, I think it was a week ago, free dental care for for seniors. It reminds me of what Daniel Andrews uh, did during the the Victorian state election. It's like uh, free breakfast and lunches for school children, uh, free dental for school children, uh, free tampons for school girls. Like uh, it's just free, 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 free. Well, it's it's a good way to buy votes, isn't it? I mean, it's mm. ridiculous. So I, I just can't believe people fall for these tricks, though. You know, this, this, this has happened for so many years now, and especially when the Liberals have just slowly started to to get the budget back in a surplus then the Labor Party just recklessly pull out a $4 billion figure on childcare. I mean, $4 billion, uh, this, this is, I mean, if anything, Morrison really should come out, and I'm sure he will. But uh, this, this is a reason, like, right there, that he can basically um, portray Labor as a high-spending party that's going to push everything back into debt like it was. I mean, it's obvious right there when, you know, billions of dollars are coming out eventually that's the, the, the direction that the country is going to go in. And I mean, when it comes to childcare in itself, a lot of people are already getting childcare for free. The ones that are actually on welfare, um, and, and the, the really thing that has always baffled me is that you have people out working and they send their kids to childcare. They have to pay like $70 a day or, or even more, which is very, you know, fairly expensive. And instead, you've got these people here that are on the dole that are getting free childcare, yet they're at home. Mm. So, I mean, these people can, they have the time to look after their own kids. So why are they sending their kids to childcare centres and getting it for nothing? This is something that I've never been able to understand. And I mean, you know, it's just the logic that the modern day politician, um, unfortunately, uh, yeah, <laughs> just baffles me really. Yeah, de definitely. And uh, going back to uh, the the minor party scene, so obviously I think the, the the biggest flop over the past three years has been the Australian Conservatives, and I was surprised when they had a vote card. They've done no preference deals, it's just vote one and number the boxes however you want. And how do you expect to get to 14.3%? They're not running any lower house candidates i see them on social media 
all the time with their high quality production. They've spent so much money. And as we saw in, in New South Wales, I'm just sort of like, you know, after this election, just, just pull the pin. Yeah, they're on their own. They're definitely on their way out. I mean, I've had I've had a lot of people that are close to the party telling me that it's slowly starting to to, to go that way. I think the only the only thing stopping it is that Bernardi still has another um, term in the Senate. Mm. But I think when it comes to um, him being up for re-election, he won't get re-elected. And I think that's when the it'll be the final nail in the coffin, so to speak, of um, the Oscons. Uh, they haven't been able to differentiate themselves. Uh, that much from the Liberals. I mean, they're definitely more conservative on a social basis than the Liberals, but really that isn't enough these days. When you've got so many minor parties that you are competing against, um, if you're not willing to take that step of being that little bit, um, you know, taboo, a little bit more extreme, um, especially more nationalistic, like a lot of them are um, on the populist angle, I think it shows that that's the angle that that's that's the way the country is heading right now that uh on the right at the end of the day that, that they're heading more to that nationalist sort of style politics and that's why you've got um you know the shooters one nations um you know all all those parties phrases um so many parties that are representing that whereas these guys here on the Auscons are still representing that um that you know free market conservative um so it's basically like the right sort of wing faction of the liberal party and that that uh, to, to voters i think that's not enough anymore you know i think people um that really don't want to vote for the liberals um they won't vote for the oscons they'll vote for something totally you know r right of center totally different and that, that's why they're failing there so i think that's where they're heading really they just haven't differentiated themselves enough and had an impact in that i mean they have some candidates that are, are quite high profile but yeah, just definitely haven't been able to make an impact on the electorate. Well, the Australian Liberty Alliance that's been reborn as Yellow Vests Australia, obviously, well, they have, in 2016, they had star candidates with Kiralee Smith and uh, Bernard Gaynor. Uh, they all left to join Australian Conservatives, but in the end are not standing for them this election. Then they had their, their star recruit, R.V. Yemeni, who ran at the state election and didn't perform well. And so now they've sort of, they've tried to hitch on the, the yellow vest movement, but they're another, you know, right-wing minor party where you'd sort of think, you know, you've you've had a couple of goes. You know, mm. it's it's not working out. True, and I, I think uh, a lot of people got turned off when they changed their name. They saw that as very opportunistic mm. that they were trying to sort of, um, you know, take over a name and and use it for their own advantage. And a lot of people didn't like that. And also, um, like you said, they've been around for a while. They haven't managed to cut through to the electorate. Um, I also, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but are they only running in the Victorian Senate or are they no, also they're running, running in other states? Yeah, they're running in other states as well. Yeah, I, I didn't notice them in New South Wales. Um, I think they might be in Western Australia, yes, possibly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but I mean, that already tells you um, that they just haven't got the support there. They Also, when it comes to lower house seats, I think they might have only had maybe one or two, just a couple. Hmm. Because um, I, I remember going, spending hours going through the whole candidate list, and they they didn't really appear very often. Um, unlike, for instance, um, Anning's party, um, which seems to have a lot of momentum, um, yeah, didn't really didn't really have a lot of time to to put the party together. Um, considering that they the AEC left it so late to approve their name, mm. but even though he did, he was still able to. Uh, end up running in one third of the the nationwide electorates in the lower house. He's got um, Senate candidates in every state and in Queensland he's um, doing 30 out of 30 seats, which I think is really big of, of a thing to do. I, I mean, I've seen elections in the past where um, parties like One Nation, for instance, hasn't even been able to do that and only they are doing it this election. But in saying that um, in previous times they haven't and they've only represented maybe 10 seats in the regional area. Um, the the Caddis party's only um, maybe got half a dozen seats that they're standing a candidate in. So, I mean, it definitely shows that in the, in the amount of time and, um, and they've, they've done pretty well to organise this. And mm. uh, maybe in the, in the future they'll do a lot better when they have more time on their hands um, next time around.
Well, there's only been two candidates which the media have been able to, to nail because of Section 44 questions. One running in, in Bendigo, she's apparently an undischarged bankrupt. And then there's one in the, the ACT. It's, I, I talked about uh, this guy's case on the Uncuckables. His criminal conviction is really bizarre, involves him stealing his own dog and then fighting the police to <laughs> stop them taking his own dog. It's a really, really bizarre thing. But yeah, the, the, the fact that they've been able to get all these candidates uh, in such a short space of time with, with just those two ones that the, the media has been able to sort of run with. But there was some controversy uh, last Friday when Fraser Anning went down to Cronulla Beach to announce his New South Wales Senate team, along with his candidate for, for Cook, which is in the area, and that's also Scott Morrison's electorate. Now, most of the media thought it was pretty provocative that he went to Cronulla Beach, where the Cronulla riots uh, against Muslims happened in in 2005. I, I know that you know Nick folks had a, uh, the Party for Freedom organizer had a, a 10 year anniversary barbecue there but like you know he, he, like nick folks he's is is a troll like you know he does does this stuff all the time that's sort of his shtick i'm not sure for like a a serious party senator that, that's sort of the uh the wise thing to do but, but yeah i mean the, the thing is though at the end of the day cronulla is in the seat of cook so mm. um Annie had um, um a candidate in representing the seat of cook and in the whole of New South Wales as a state, he only had five candidates um, in the many, many, you know, dozen seats. I mean, I think New South Wales has maybe close to 50 seats or, or something, 40, 50 seats that they have as, um, as representation. He's only got five. So, um, I mean, he had to pick somewhere to launch his campaign. Uh, Cronulla is, is definitely um, a heated area for, for past history and, and all, all sorts. But I mean, I, I guess he could have seen this as that it might gain a little bit of publicity because of it, which would have been good for his party just to get his name out there. And also the fact that um, um, with Cronulla, that it, there is a lot of people that live there that do hold uh, nationalistic uh, views. So obviously it would be a, a good place to launch his party there in New South Wales. Um, apart from that, I mean, the only other areas that he, he had uh, candidates run, I, I know he had one, I think, that was in North Sydney, which I think wouldn't have been a good idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, think, I think that's in um, in Tony Abbott's seat of Warringah. I think he has a candidate because, I mean, that, that seat just doesn't really represent what he stands for. Um, he had another one out, um, out in the southwest seat of Hume, um, which could have been an all right area yeah. as well. But, I, I, I mean, all in all, I mean, Cook, I guess, did generate more of a publicity because of the the history of Cronulla. But there was only a couple areas that he could have picked. So um, if he didn't have a candidate representing him Cook and he chose Cronulla, then yes, you could say that he purposely done it to, to cause drama. Um, but because he does have a candidate there, it's a, it's a bit hard to say that. I mean, yes, he did gain publicity because of it. But at the end of the day, you have to do it somewhere. So... Um, his party platform has, has definitely, you know, um, had a lot of resounding support. It's definitely cut through. I mean, it's um, it's not the usual sort of uh, centre-right minor party spill. It, it's more than that. He's gone further and really, you know, he wants to reconnect with um, the the way that it was at Federation when it, when it comes to, you know, um, identity, when it comes to, um, you know, going hard on banks, um, you know, economic protectionist policy, which is very, you know, um, popular out there in the electorate. I mean, he's, he's basically, in the whole election campaign, the very, um, or the most anti-establishment candidates. I mean, no matter if you're a left-wing or right-wing person, you can't deny that. I mean, he is the, the most anti-globalist, anti-establishment candidate there is, or, or party there is. 
Um, even if you don't like him, you have to admit that to be true because it is. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even when, well, like, as we'll get into it in a moment, even News Corp consider him an extremist. And it was a News mm. Corp journalist there, uh, Eliza Barr, she was um, asking questions of Fraser Anning and his supporters there uh, didn't like it. They started to, to heckle her. People have said, well, she had the, the right to ask questions but uh, I'm not sure like do journalists have the right to ask questions in public and the the public aren't allowed to say what they think of them that's that's what I thought well we haven't got all the full details with what happened so I mean it's very hard I mean we've seen a little bit of a video clip but it doesn't say a lot I mean yeah yeah we'll, we'll get to yeah. what yeah. happened afterwards so mm, uh, definitely, yeah. what ha uh, this reporter Eliza Barr, she was with a photographer, Dylan Robertson. Now, he followed one of the, the hecklers, which was a 19-year-old gentleman, Max Town. He's um, been associated with the uh, Lad Society in Sydney and the, the True Blue Crew. Now, the photographer got right in his face and uh, Max Town lashed out at him through uh, a few uh, punches. He was um, later uh, arrested and charged with uh, assaulting the photographer and apparently making a disparaging comment to Eliza Barr. There's, there's definitely a lot of fake news saying that he assaulted her primarily. That's, that's fake. That's, that, that didn't happen. But of course, it's, it's what we, like, he shouldn't have done it. Like, it's a stupid thing to do. Like, it just yeah. plays into the, like, uh, uh, the narrative about Anning's uh, supporters. But, you know, we, we do need to call out some of the, the, the fake news around it and, like, objectively you know, report the situation. Yeah, it was definitely a stupid thing to do. I mean, it doesn't benefit him at all because now he's uh, going to go through the court systems and if he gets um, charged, he's going to have a criminal conviction for something really stupid. Uh, it, it just, um, I, I don't know how it all started, but it will be interesting to see what, what actually took place. I mean, it could have even been the case that there might have been some provocation there. And, I mean, you, you always hear left-wing media and um, commentators um, talk about provoca uh, provocation um, a lot when you have like for instance um, you know, Neil Erickson and people like that um, getting um, the faces of the left and then you know to try and bait them and then the left you know um, go towards them and, and, and throw a punch or something and then you know um, people say that that was justified because he was up in their face in the first yeah, place. Yeah, well, that's that's, yeah. yeah, if that's the case then you know you also have to be unbiased when it comes to that. If that's what took place here that the cameraman was really up in his face and, and um, you know, uh, baiting him, and then that, that's what took place. And you can't really sort of then have a different opinion on it. I mean, it, it is what it is, you know, regardless of who on who did it and who it was to, you've got to have a fair and reasonable balanced view here um, when it comes to that. And Anning said in his subsequent press conference that it's the, the leftist agitators, they're the ones that are more violent, which is, which is true. But of course, the, yeah. the media is gonna, uh, has been saying, I should say, oh, this is the type of person that Fraser Anning uh, attracts, and this is why he's you know, a danger uh, to our uh, democracy. And you know, have, like, you know, look at how he treats you know, members trying to ask him questions. 100%. I mean, the left are very violent. I mean, if, 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 if the left come out and, and, and talk about, oh, well, you know, but what about the UPS? What about the True Blue Clue? But these, these people, I mean, I've never seen cases where these people have come out and actually attacked people. I mean, they've, they've done rallies. Okay, they might be in your face and so forth. But at the end of the day, their rallies, as far as I know, haven't had any violent episodes. I mean, unless there was, you know, uh, a fight that, you know, both sides were involved in, but they haven't gone out and purposely actually physically harmed people. But with the Antifa um, uh, people, for instance, they do that quite often. I mean, you can ask people, for instance, like Dan Evans, um, a few years back, they got attacked with uh, fluorescent tubes mm. and, and split his head open. And um, all he was doing basically was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was just out the front of uh, of one of the the anarchist bookshops, and that, that that's what happened to him. As a result, they recognised him. They came out and started hitting him for no reason. We've also had uh, 
other people um, in the past when it comes to either reclaim rallies or uh, or things like that, that, you know, Antifa has been a presence and they've gone after um, um, patriots and, and, you know, hit them and hurt them, you know. And, I mean, it's, it's quite a common theme. You see it, you know, happening all around the world. Um, unfortunately... Yeah, and then, then people like to point to, oh, but what about the episodes over in the, in the USA, you know, um, uh, you know, a one-off thing that happened over there. But uh, that isn't a common a common thing that ha- that occurs yeah. very often at all. I mean, you yeah. just don't see it from the right at all. Yeah. We heard from the, the White Rose Society, the uh, nationalist uh, doxing website. Uh, they'd been quite quiet. They hadn't posted since the beginning of January, but they bit, uh, did a big dump on... Uh, Max Town posting like pretty much doxing his whole family, uh, which is something that they always do. But they alleged that he hangs around uh, Newtown, being an Antifa hunter, looking for Antifa members to assault in in in, in a hoodie. Which it'll be interesting to to hear uh, what uh, Max has to to say uh, for himself. But you know, the the White Rose Society, these uh, you know they're they're prone to exaggeration but of course the the media will take what uh they've seen as as gospel i mean they're all like unverified allegations at this stage Uh, i think the worst thing about it is when they leak to media and media actually take their their um you know what they say as gospel i mean i can't believe that Mm. i really can't believe that a lot of these uh, journalists that work for, you know, either The Age or, you know, Sydney Morning Herald or, or, or The Guardian, The Guardian's a big one, um, that they actually, you know, rely on, on info that the White Rose Society actually hand them and then they report on it like it's, you know, somehow factual. I mean, just coming from, you know, such an extremist organisation, I mean, just imagine, um, you know, if a, a News Corp journalist, for instance, or, you know, someone from Sky News um, actually uh, had people from, say, um, the Lad Society or TBC or something um, giving them information or, or and they were actually posting it as, as a factual sort of, uh, you know, story, you know. Uh, it, it's ridiculous. It really is. Uh, it's so unprofessional. And it just shows how biased um, biased these journalists are. And it, it really is, is uh, a shame that they can get away with this. They, they really get away with it and, and there's no um, legal ramifications for, for, for these kind of activities, you know, I mean, for, for these lies that they post. And, and this is supposed to be journalism, really, you know. Yeah, I mean, they've, you know, alleged uh, ridiculous things against the uh, the unshackled. And mm-hmm. like you said, it's where we've seen, you know, Alex Mann regurgitate mm-hmm. White Rose Society and Slack Bastard things on the, the ABC. Definitely. I mean, he, he, he's, he's one of the big culprits, um, unfortunately. And I, I just, it, it seems like he, for instance, a lot of the time you just think this guy has purposely been employed just to spend his whole journalistic career just to basically watch every move that um, a right-wing group does, you know, just to work as a spy really because every time i see him come out with something it's um you know uh, either a podcast or an article or something it's on a uh this right wing extremist group is doing this you know the the far right are rising and this is happening and that's happening and you think how is this you know journalism i mean why aren't they talking about antifa why aren't they talking about the left renewal faction of the greens getting in you know um taking over their party um Mm. no they're not talking about that they're talking about uh you know lads or tbc groups really that i mean apart apart from just having some people that you know gather together and um have some food and talk politics and you know occasionally um, some of them might do a rally for instance like tbc or something apart from that they really um don't do much else you know i mean to, to think that that's somehow a uh a national disaster and that um, that's somehow um, rising extremism that, that, that is causing a lot of uh, a lot of problems in society. I mean, just because these people have views that don't fit in with the mainstream. And that, that, that's what I mean. We on our side of politics allow for um, the other side to um, hold their views, but they don't for us. And that, 
that that's why in a lot of ways they're winning because they continue to try and shut us down. Whereas uh, in the right wing philosophy, in, in in a lot of uh, people on the right, is that people should have free speech. And um, as much as that might be a great principle and the right principle to have, at the end of the day, um, we're, we're seeing it work against us um, because they don't hold that same view. So um, that, that's an unfortunate thing that we've noticed. That's well, true. Fraser Anning, he also got into trouble uh, for a tweet uh, that was uh, sent out where he said that he would ban both Muslim and black immigration, which most people interpreted that anyone of dark skin, he would ban from Australia, which you can technically call a racist policy. You can actually use that, use that term. And he was asked about that at his sub subsequent press conference, and he said he would only ban uh, Sudanese uh, immigration. And that tweet was later deleted. But yeah, I thought that wasn't a smart tweet to, to send out if you said well pe I, I would say people from north african nations because mm. sudan and mm. somalia they're the the trouble spots like definitely having a a ban like trump has on nations in my opinion trump yeah. didn't go far enough and and ban uh, if, uh immigration from nations such as saudi arabia and uh, qatar uh so uh Definitely, I think having nation-specific bans is fine, but if you say, like, people with black skin are banned completely, I mean, that's that, that's just absurd. Yeah, I, I think most people would have uh, understood what he meant, but it didn't come across the right way with, with mm. him using that term. I think it would have been better that he used maybe African immigration, um, for instance, uh, I mean, he could have even said sub-Saharan African, which, I mean, the, those people tend to be involved in a lot of the gang violence, like with the Sudanese, Somalians, and, and so forth. So that could have been a term he could have used that wasn't, um, you know, black, so to speak, you know. But in saying that, though, I mean, if that's racist, then many of the people or our politicians on both sides that refuse to take in the, the white South Africans must be pretty racist, too. Because yeah. it doesn't seem like they're making any effort there, are they? So, um, I mean, you can look at this both sides. You can look at it in both ways. And um, that that's the thing, really. It, it, yeah. <laughs> now, while we're having our election over in Australia, the uh, 2020 uh, presidential election, even though it's in November next year, uh, the Democrat field is very uh, crowded. Uh, there's 21 candidates contesting the the primaries and we just saw a 76 year old former vice president joe biden enter the race and uh, he is now leading in the polls uh, coming second is uh, bernie sanders the 77 year old democratic uh, socialist and now it's quite ironic that you know this is the democrats are now the party of identity politics uh, inter intersectionality out of a diverse field of 21 candidates it's <laughs> two old white dudes who are leading the field <laughs> yeah yeah uh I mean, that, that, that must show that, um, I mean, what they preach in regards to diversity, that it's a, it's a real stupid policy to have. I mean, if you have two candidates that happen to be uh, old white guys, I mean, I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not somebody that would, that would use it in a cuckish way to sort of, you know, put it back on them and say, oh, look, you know, why is, why is two guys in your field, you know, old white guys, they're, they're the best you have. But, I mean, maybe... It, it might mean that we shouldn't be really so uh, infused on this whole notion of that we need somebody to be a woman or we need somebody to be an LGBT representative. Maybe we should just have the, the best candidates for the job. Well, they um, are the best two you know? candidates that are in the field. I yeah. mean, they're the most yeah. sane out of a party mm. that's gone full SJW. Mm. Yeah, well, well, well that, that's right. I mean, those two guys are very experienced. Um, I'm not fans of them by any chance. Uh, um, in, in two different, I mean, they're very two two different candidates, very different in their in their views. Um, one representing the, um, you know, just a real socialistic sort of uh, far left kind of the party, and the other one representing a more uh, moderate sort of uh, establishment kind of uh, approach. Um, I, I, I mean, I guess I, I think you'd have to say that 
Biden will probably end up getting it um, mm. because I think he's, I mean, he, he was a, obviously under Obama as, as a vice, so he's, he's definitely got a big name out there. Sanders has support, but his support isn't so widespread over the party. It's, it's very uh, niche. I wouldn't be surprised if those two guys are the ones that end up going at it at the end. I mean, it's it's bound to happen because I don't see any of the other candidates being um, of much quality. And not quality in saying that they're people that I um, I agree with, but quality is in um, good at what they do. I, uh, when you're looking at, at, at people like Warren, for instance, and, um, and you know, Cortez and stuff, I mean, you're just thinking... This is if this is the future, you know. I mean, we're in a lot of trouble here. I mean, yeah. you don't oh, have to you don't have to agree with the policies, but these these people are just crazy, you know. Oh, well, thankfully, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, she's too young to to run for yeah. president. But I noticed <laughs> these experienced Democrats, the ones who actually you know, believe that the economy and jobs are important, have had enough of her. I thought it was quite funny what Nancy Pelosi, the House Speaker, she's also in her late uh, 70s, she she congratulated the, the Democrats who won seats off Republicans and said that uh, those who ran in uh, safe Democrat uh, districts like uh, Cortez, like, oh, this glass of water could have won the seat. The, <laughs> that's right. I mean... You, you, you get all these sort of, um, I mean, look at Andrew Yang. <laughs> mm. I mean, you know, this, this, this guy here is, is just ab absolutely nuts. I mean, when you look at his views, a lot of people um, on the right, actually, the, the, the nationalists have come out and said, oh, we support him um, on the basis of accelerationism, you know, like, uh, but he, his views are really, you know, out there. Mm. Um, and... I mean, they're, they're even worse than Sanders. I mean, that, that's how yeah. bad they are. Then you um, have um, Beto O'Rourke, who, well, he's yeah. an alleged uh, Latina. And then, of course, you have uh, Camilla Harris, who she fell for the Jesse Smollett uh, fake uh, hate crime. She called it a modern-day lynch lynching. Yeah. They're, they're, they're really... The, the, the amount of quality on the left is, is just ridiculous. I mean, it, it's the, it really, really shows you... On, on which side of politics things seem to be the most sane. Um, because these people, you have to understand that these candidates, a lot of them don't actually, you know, have real jobs. They, they've come out of university and they become staffers or lawyers, for instance, most likely one of the two, um, or they even get involved in unions. And then they go straight into politics after that. So they haven't, they haven't got the job experience that um, somebody that, for instance, um, is a teacher or a nurse or, you know, a small business owner. I mean, these are people that uh, people, people in the electric can connect with because they represent your everyday Australian. I mean, whereas lawyers, I mean, union delegates, um, uh, staffers, political staffers, I mean, they're in their own world. And that's what the left seems to breed the most. Uh, I mean, at least on the right, you, you, you get a lot of business owners and, you know, people like that that are very experienced, very smart, wise, have made great decisions in life to, to get where they are. Um, but you just don't get that on the other side of politics. And they do tend to be very SJW, like you mentioned, and very crazy. <laughs> they, they have very, um, very out their view. Uh, so on social policies, so progressive that... You know, I mean, these people here that, you know, stuff, you know, late-term abortions, they'd, they'd let you kill newborns if they had the yeah, chance. Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, these people are really crazy, you know? That's messed up. Well, Joe Biden, yeah. he seems to have uh, survived the, the inappropriate physical contact scandal. Now, the, the Unshackled was onto this uh, before anyone else. He was nominated for our 2017 uh, Degenerate of the Year Award. If you look at, like, the way he touched these women, it's... Well, he's got the nickname now, Creepy Uncle Joe, which I think is quite deserved. Now, th there's obviously, like, there's no allegations of actual sexual misconduct against him, but, you know, it's fair to make the point that, you know, hey, we're living in the Me Too age, you know, Joe Biden, you've got to, you've got to sort of get with the times if you want to be the, the president. Well, actually, I'm going to enjoy seeing the battle between these two because Sanders is going to be expected to use that against Joe. And anything that's really going to go after Joe's um, creepy ways, I, I reckon it's going to be great seeing that, um, you know, in the media for, for people to attack him on that. It would be great because 
we've seen it uh, for a long time now, for years, um, not only to women, but to children a lot. Yeah, that seen, yeah. Um, you know, get behind them and, you know, massage their shoulders and go in, you know, for a, for a little sort of sneak kiss and stuff. Mm. Very, really, really creepy. I mean, uh, very pedophile sort of behavior. I mean, that's that's a nice sort of soft way of putting it because I don't want to be coming out um, as definitely, you know, making accusations or anything, but it uh, it seems that way when you see video footage. That's what it is, you know. It just doesn't seem to add up, and um, unfortunately, you know, it's taken a long time for this to come out. Um, it's all captured on video. That's the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. But not many people have have really spoken about it. You know, now that he's running for president, it's definitely going to be spoken about more often. It's going to be mm. very, you know, widely used. Yeah. Um, Especially, even though the Democrats might be united against Trump, I mean, when it, when it comes to battling them themselves, they're going to definitely. This is one thing that Trump has his up, up his sleeve here that the, the the Democrats are going to go hard against each other. I would say, and that would definitely whoever ends up coming out on top, it would damage their profile so much because of all the attacks that other people in the party have put on them as the, as the lead up. Whereas Trump hasn't got that because he's the um, the president, so he doesn't have to go through that, um, you know, that process. Yeah, um, of definitely true. And it was funny actually that uh, Joe Biden recently came out. Um, I think it was maybe about a month ago. He came out and sort of said, "Oh, you know, I understand that times have changed now, and that you mm. know, I should be a little bit more sort of." Yeah. Then he then he said that um, you know Donald Trump supported neo Nazis in Charlottesville. That was his campaign, you know message launch yeah well you know like i mean if that's all you've got just just to to, to go after such a really sort of uh you know e easy sort of target like that oh you know this person's a neo-nazi i mean it these, these terms are very overused nowadays that um so much so it's going to mean nothing in the future because uh, it's just been overly used you know like pe people people are used to hearing nazis racist homophobe you know mm. xenophobe um, and most of the time when accusations are put out there that the people don't even fit those labels. It's just um, a way of stopping speech. I, I, I don't like this person, so I will try and uh, label them in a way that people will um, yeah. you know, disassociate yeah, them. It happens. Um, yeah. happens all the time. We're, we're all too mm. used to it. Well, if anyone wants um, light relief, uh, uh, somebody has brought up the, the Joe Biden dot info URL. So, so go there for, to get a, a feel of Joe Biden's, uh, campaign. I think you'll find it, uh, very humorous. Well, we've run out of time now, Damien, but thanks for uh, helping everyone get up to speed on, uh, Australian politics and, and touching on the, the United States to, to use a pun to do with Joe Biden. Uh, and yeah. Definitely, uh, as I as I said before, we'll we'll have these these regular weekly chats uh, uh, as as often as we can. Now it's great to be here, Tim, and um, look forward to more in the future. And that's the show for today. Apologies for the shows being a bit light lately, but with the new Uncuckables commitment every Thursday night, keeping up with production of this show has been a challenge, but we're in the middle of another exciting expansion period for The Unshackled, which requires a lot of organization and development. Make sure you follow us on your preferred social media platform, including free speech social media. We are on gab.ai slash The Unshackled. We are also on minds.com slash The underscore Unshackled. We also have the MeWe page at mewe.com slash p slash the unshackled and we also have our growing telegram channel on the encrypted messaging service which is increasing in popularity over at t.me slash the unshackled during this next expansion period uh, the financial support of you our followers goes a long way you can pledge over at patreon.com slash the unshackled or directly via paypal.me slash the unshackled we also have our premium membership option on our website at the unshackled shackle.net slash support options slash premium membership. Thank you to all those who've signed up and contributed recently. We're going to air on a Monday night, so stay tuned at 9.15pm Australian Eastern Standard Time for XYZ Live on the Maddie Rose Live channel. Until then, thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next show. 
Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and comments.